Um, I've assembled a, a panel today for you about real doers, uh, designers, implementers. They're setting these projects, they're out building these projects right now. And I really want to just jump into that conversation with them about the design and construction of some of these projects that we all utilize. Um, I'm going to let each of the panelists kind of introduce themselves because they can talk about their specific level of work. And at the same your own introduction, if you'll also start with the question of who are you seeing out there using that project or program right now? And what kind of activity levels on that project are you seeing being mobilized? We've got one more panelist who's going to come to you on this Sorry. Come on up. My vet called. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm going to start at the end with Keith. Why don't you take a, introduce yourself there? Hello, everyone. My name is Keith Rawls. I'm the executive director of Zip Bike Share. Uh, Zip Bike Share is one of Red's many initiatives. Uh, it launched in 2015 October, so we're almost three years in now. Uh, we have uh, 40 stations and roughly 400 bicycles. The unique thing about the uh, Zip uh, Birmingham uh, bike share system is it was the first in North America to have the uh, pedal electric assist bicycle. So that's a feather in your cap, and that was part of the attraction for me to come from Nashville to be the operator of this system. Uh, going back to Nashville, I was a GM and launched that system back in 2012. Uh, and before that, I was in the Navy for 20 years. Uh, I also worked with the health department in Nashville to get that system off the ground. Uh, and who I see using our product? Everyone. I mean, from all walks of life, as long as you're 18 and above, you're welcome to be on the zip bike. And if you're not, you had better be accompanied by a parent. <laughs> Hello, can you hear me? Oh, yeah. Okay, good. Uh, I'm Jane Reed Ross. I'm a landscape been working in the Birmingham area for about 30 years now. Um, I work with GMC, Bill Mills Kwood. We do most of the public space projects, uh, streetscapes, parks, trails, and the like. And, uh, and, and, and our motto is building communities. And nothing like public space builds communities better and brings people together. Uh, I went to, um, I grew up here in Alabama, lived in Huntsville, which is very car-centric went to Auburn University and studied landscape architecture where I got to ride my bike and walk everywhere. It was fantastic. It was, it was, it was true freedom going from um, suburbia where you had to drive everywhere to a walkable campus. And during the summers, I got to go live for five summers. I did internships in Washington, D.C. And that gave me the design vocabulary that I still draw on today. I rode my bike everywhere. There was Rock Creek Park, Sligo Creek Park, um, the Washington Memorial Parkway with its trails went all the way out to Mount Vernon, the CNO Canal that went out, you know, 20 or 40 miles beyond, and, and even further down to several other states. Um, it was the most incredible experience. Um, I was connected as a poor, economically challenged student. I could go anywhere in that city go to free museums and um, neighborhoods with festivals and um, all, all, the mu all the things that that city has to offer, all the beautiful design and parks everywhere. So when I moved back to Alabama and Birmingham specifically, I wanted to bring that work back here and be able to um, help connect the dots here. And early in the 90s, we started working on the Shades Creek Greenway. Um, and in the first few years, you know, we envisioned that as a trail from Irondale all the way to Hooper. Um, and in the first <laughs> few attempts of applying for funding, we um, found out that that was a little bit too big a piece to bite off that we needed to make it smaller. And we went after just the Homewood section, and we were successful in getting funding for that. Um, but in those days, and this is the good news, in those days, it was so, this conversation was so hard, so difficult. Because you know, you're talking about trails and connectivity and people walking and cycling. People are like, they didn't know what you're talking about. They're like, well, nobody ever walks there. Nobody ever cycles there. So why put a trail there? Who has heard that um, question before? You know, why put a trail there if nobody's walking there? You had to have a vision to walk there. But now, Fast forward several decades, um, everybody's talking about this. Everybody wants it. And it's, it's a brand new day. Um, as you saw with the mayors up here and the 
councilmen talking. You know, they're, uh, everybody wants this now, so it, it's, it's, it's really just incredible. Um, I'd like to add, too, that, and then I'll give it to James. Um, we uh, worked on the Red Rock uh, Trail Master Plan at GMC, working with the Freshwater Land Trust and the Health Department on developing that plan. And um, out of that was born um, the sidewalk inventory for the city of Birmingham, which we um, did a GIS inventory of all the sidewalks in Birmingham to prioritize what is needed there. Um, and, um, oh, and the question you asked that we were supposed to consider um, then was... Who's currently using the trail that you're saying? Right, right. Part, part of that Red Rock plan, we had some tiger projects that were funded. Mm -hmm. And the Jones Valley Trail that goes eventually will go from Red Mountain to downtown to Ruffner Mountain in the east. Parts of that are built. And part of that trail from 20th Street to 32nd Street along First Avenue South is built. And it runs right by my office. I look out on it daily. And it is so distracting to see all the different people using that trail. It's amazing. I just look up and look all the time constantly. Oh, like, hi. How are you doing? You know, I am. I knew people would do it. We knew that, that that would happen. But all the traffic that's getting, I, you know, strollers, uh, people taking work break, talking on the cell phone, it's amazing. Everybody's doing that trail. And, and, and that's the good news. And that's the importance of what these projects do. Because no one building, you know, very few buildings in our community, everybody can use. But everybody can use our sidewalks and trails. Everybody. If, if we I'm James Fowler. I'm the uh, new uh, director of uh, Department of Transportation for the City of Birmingham. And I'm uh, humbled to be in that position. I've been in there, uh, that position for about two and a half months, almost three months. And uh, we recently actually renamed the department from the Department of Traffic Engineering to the Department of Transportation in an effort to de emphasize uh, the emphasis on traffic, but actually to multimodalism in our department and uh, we're going through the process right now working with the leadership in the department to develop a strategic plan for the city's Department of Transportation and so the very first sentence of the, the vision is that Bir the Birmingham Department of Transportation should to develop and maintain a safe and efficient multimodal transportation system that is rooted in supporting walkable vibrant communities and it's rooted in that walkability because that's so important for creating places so for, uh, I think Councilor O'Quinn said it really well, for over half a century, maybe even a, a, a century, we've been in the process of building auto-oriented communities. And here in Birmingham, we've very much deconstructed our walkable centers. And so our transportation system, which helps us move around in our cars, has been one of the very things that has uh, undercut the integrity of our walkable places. And so we're focused on rebuilding that. And so the future, I hope, transportation in Birmingham is that we connect to places and within places, but we don't undermine those places with the transportation system itself. And so we focus on walkability, and that's why it's rooted in walkability. That's the vision for our department. Um, so I'm excited about it, and I think in terms of who's using the transportation system as a whole in Birmingham, I think it's everybody. Um, but currently, it's everybody in a car for the most part, but there are a lot of users now that we're seeing walking and um, I just moved downtown um, and I see a lot of young couples, I especially see a lot of retirees, and I am encouraged because I've started to see even strollers downtown, so it's that, that demographic is changing and evolving, so I'm excited about that. Well, before Carolyn speaks, thank you so much for having a department that has a vision statement that's in keeping with the city's comprehensive plan and statement. I think as a city planner, you don't hear that very often that individual city departments are taking on a vision of how they're going to do their day-to-day -day work in keeping with the comp plan. That's, that's an amazing feat. Yep. So kudos, yes, yeah. congratulations. Good. <laughs> hey guys, my name is Carolyn Buck, and I'm kind of an untraditional uh, player in all of this. I actually work for the Freshwater Land Trust, which is a land conservation group. So we, um, our mission is to protect and enhance the water quality and habitat. So we normally would not be who you think of when you start talking about urban planning and design. Uh, but I think over the last couple of years, we have been a valuable player in that discussion. 
And so, to, I, yesterday I attended the dinner, and a lot of people asked, so, so why are you guys here? And so to get some history about the Freshwater Land Trust, we were actually born out of um, a settlement action because of violations to the Clean Water Act, which is a really exciting way to start your organization. But what it did was allowed us to, uh, we were charged with the mission of buying up property that ran along our riparian corridors, which we have five of here in Jefferson County, and a lot of people don't know that. Um, and the purpose of us was to, to buy up that property to make sure that we were curbing developmental pressures on our riparian corridors, um, and to provide uh, filtration, uh, filtration services to enhance our clean water. Um, and so we were busy doing that for about 10 years, uh, and we, we were having success, and the community as a whole did like what we were doing, but we were not resonating with people on an individual level. We weren't really changing minds on the way conservation should be viewed holistically. And what we realized is uh, people don't care about property that you're protecting if they're not allowed to go and walk on that property. Uh, so we weren't really uh, making an impact. Uh, so we had all of this land in urban settings, which you know developers love to develop, uh, but we weren't letting anybody access it, and so they just didn't care. Um, so we did two large projects, uh, conservation-minded, that, that, that was the purpose of the projects, but they ended up being public parks. So you might know them if you're from here, Red Mountain Park, or Green Creek Nature Preserve. Um, and so those have great conservation value. But by allowing people to access those, we were able to see as an organization what an impact it had to allow people to uh, explore their natural environment. Um, so we had to relook at our organization and our mission to kind of decide how are we going to move forward if we really want to make an impact on the environmental uh, health of our community? And so access was what we came up with. And so in 2012, we worked with GMC and the uh, health department to create what is now known as the Red Rock Trail System, which is a master plan of over 750 miles of um, parks, it's hiking trails, it's multi-use paths for bikers and runners and walkers, and also sidewalks and bike lanes, with a vision that every resident in Jefferson County would have a green space where they can get outside, they can engage in their natural environment, they can recognize that we have water resources and protected um, species and all sorts of great things that Central Alabama has, um, that they have right outside of their backyard that they just weren't noticing. And so we wanted to get people out there to be able to connect with their environment. Um, and we wanted people to be able to connect to those green spaces without the need of a car. Um, because obviously, we also saw the opportunity to reduce the impact of our environment by uh, promoting alternative transportation. Um, and so we have been working over the last about five years to really push this plan. So we work with cities, we work with residential groups to not only advocate for complete streets, um, which is helpful for all users, um, but also to build those green spaces that are meaningful for the community and that people will actually want to go out and use. Um, and so that's kind of what we have been focused on over the last couple of years. Um, and when you ask about who uses them, everyone. Um, somebody recently said trails is where life happens. And I really love that because if you go out to uh, our trails, if you go out to the streets of Birmingham, you do see uh, new moms taking walks. You see uh, friends who are going on a walk and connecting. Um, you see people who are trying to get a hold of their health and really uh, make some changes. Um, we see it all, and um, we're really excited about that. And obviously, we hope that it uh, creates a lasting conservation and stewardship mindfulness in the city. Um, but the further benefits of it, you know, of health and viral communities and equity for all people to get to where they need to be, like schools and libraries, are just a great um, kind of side game that we that we like to play. That's awesome. Now, one of the nice things about this panel in particular is that we're all very connected to the Ridge and Valley Trail system. Um, and we can each speak to that. So why don't we start with some big picture kind of questions about that since you've got the mics. We'll Ooh. start with this in. Um, so that is a, like you said, a huge system, 750 miles, mm -hmm. crisscrossing not just, well, all of Jefferson County, which is you know, the Every community in all of Jefferson County. With 27 municipalities for Jefferson County, I think that's right. Around 27. So a huge number of cities and communities that are interconnected. What are some of the, the wins that we're having right now in that trail system? I know 
know we've got pieces kind of being developed all over, not only the city of Birmingham, but the county. What are some big wins lately and kind of the strategy going forward for that next phase? Yeah, so we've had a lot of development on our Jones Valley Trail, which was really the, the central spine of the entire system. Uh, Burberry Trail is on that, so, um, you know, that has, that is the most Instagrammable place in all of Birmingham. If you go there any day, at any time, you'll see it is packed. Um, and so that was a really early, maybe not early win, but um, it really helped to start set some of these conversations in motion, um, and it started getting investors interested in it. And you saw that with the opening of the Kiwanis Falcon Trail, which happened in March. And to date, probably, uh, we took the counter off, but I imagine it's about probably worked to 18,000 users just since March, and the majority of people in town do not know it exists. So um, once you build it, if you build it correctly, if you uh, engage your communities, if you're engaging your different partners, uh, people do show up and they love it, and then they get very angry that it stops, and then they demand that you keep it going, because why did you not get it to this part, or why did you not bring it to my house? And that is a great conversation, and we're really excited um, because it makes our work easier when we want to extend the trail. People get it, and they're excited about it, um, and it makes it a little easier. Yeah. So now, James, you've just inherited this partner, and all these trails that crisscross the Moose Valley here in Jargo. How are, what are, what are you finding that's exciting that's coming out of this, this new lattice that's laid across the city for you? Well, I think that we have a lot of uh, great potential in Birmingham. So one of our biggest assets actually is our well-connected street grid. We have a very walkable downtown urban grid that comes from a different era, really. It comes from a time before the automobile was so dominant. And so that street grid, if we think about the most walkable places in America, so like if I think about cities, I think about Savannah and Charleston, and I think about Portland, they have these really tight and well-integrated street grids. And Birmingham's lucky in the southeast that we have that. And uh, so I'm excited about the opportunity to link these trail systems that connect different neighborhoods and different areas into our downtown network. Um, and I would further say that something that I'm excited about is that we are having this conversation because I think the front lines uh, or the edge of that um, advancement of walkability, it often happens in those individual conversations with our peers and with our neighbors. Uh, because in my current role and in my previous role at UAB, I was in a lot of neighborhood meetings um, being a representative for the organization, but what I saw there were a lot of developers coming to present ideas about uh, new projects that would increase density and walkability in the communities, but there are a lot of people that while I think they in their heart hearts appreciate those things, they don't necessarily know how to advocate well for them, and so like when a developer asks for a parking variance, for instance, there's always some people that whose hackles come up and say, no, we can't build this unless you build enough parking. And I think we have to really challenge ourselves and recognize that there's trade-offs. If we want to have a walkable downtown and an urban infrastructure, then we have to challenge some of those old ideas. And if someone wants to build a building on a surface parking lot, then yeah, that will create some discomfort with respect to our auto access, but it also creates some huge walkability benefits. And so there's a responsibility on all of us to have some of those awkward conversations with our neighbors, with our friends, um, with our elected officials, so that we're challenging some of those ideas and, and being okay with some of that awkward transition away from auto dependence towards walkability. But I think that's some of the things that uh, I'm seeing and some of the things I'm excited about because I think the folks in this room are probably preaching to the choir, but I do challenge you to uh, talk to some of the people that are in your life that are experiencing these things and not be the, the cavemen. So. And now, Jane. You yourself, personally, have been involved in a lot of the design of this trail system and some of the segments, and specifically the rotary trail piece. Um, so from a designer standpoint, as a landscape architect, what are you seeing as some of the, the early wins, some of those little technical details or design pieces that have really made the trail work and succeed in terms of attracting users and use and its kind of longevity of the city? Well, a big win for the um Red Rock Master Plan um, was getting that tire funding and starting getting some pieces into place. Um, and then the Rotary Club uh, raising um, almost $4 million to build the Rotary Trail because that was sort of a wow factor. You know, we had a piece of it that captured everybody's attention. And as far as 
building and trail system, we've got to brand it. And people got to re recognize, you know, they're now starting to call, you know, thank goodness we've shortened the name from Red Rock Ridge and Valley System to just Red Rock System. So we, we, we drop, drop the Ridge and Valley. It's just Red Rock, that's cool, isn't it? And, uh, and so we're starting to get these pieces in place. But um, so, you know, that eye-catching rotary trail was really great to identify the system as the central spine. But what probably what the biggest component right now that's happening is that we're all having this conversation and we've got the zip bikes in place and, and we've got Carolyn Buck, who's the Red Rock Trail Coordinator. She is out there working and connecting people, talking to mayors and council people and, and connecting groups. We've got James Fowler, the head of transportation now with a vision. With these people in place, and yourself too, Ben, at Web Rev. I just leave the conversation. Yeah. <laughs> all, of, all of this, I, you know, I see the city really changing dramatically in the next decade. I'm very excited about it. That's just, it's phenomenal. It's, you know, that now the conversation is not being forced or sold or whatever. It is happening. And, and that's the biggest thing right there. Yeah. And Keith, from a, a programming user, I mean, um, talk a little bit about ZIP and how it functions not only on that, that corridor we're talking about right now, the First Avenue South corridor, but as the, the rest of the ZIP kind of network is overlaid in that and the way people are using the system. Ongoing uh, since I arrived back in uh, February 2016, uh, I've been working with on the stage in uh, different capacities, obviously with James being at UAB and then Carolyn at, at Red Rock and discussing the, uh, the actual hardware that's on the ground now and the connectivity that actually exists that actually will allow us to complement these sites with the amenity of bike sharing. Uh, it's so robust and it's so energetic that Zip Bike Share was awarded the Safe Routes of Park grant early in the spring it's through the JBJ Foundation, a national program to address uh, connecting parks, a lot of people to get access to parks. And not only was Birmingham one of 10 cities selected, Zip Bike Share was the only bike sharing system to undertake such a grant. So through this grant process, we launched in early spring, we've uh, developed a route to connect the uh, Smithfield neighborhood to the Tennisville neighborhood at Memorial Park. Uh, we conducted a tactical urbanism pop-up with the help of Ben and, and Robert uh, from Rev to assist us with the tactical urbanism piece. We were able to produce bike lanes on Center Street and we kicked it off on a Saturday for a Smithfield uh, residence only. We were very intentional about who we invited. We didn't want uh, the, the people in this room there because we know you get it. What we're trying to do is we're trying to reach the impacted folks and why they're not using this station. It's located right across the street from their houses. They came out with roads. It was the highest amount of uh, surveys we were able to gather on a particular, a particular Saturday and we were able to show how you can actually put a uh, street on the diet and have James have this in his hip pocket to take the leaders in the city and say, yes, it can be done and this is how you do it and this is how it looks. So we can go ahead and move a lot faster than we normally would. So, and then looking at, you know, the Jones Valley Trail, once again, we're looking at potentially dropping the station to connect uh, you from downtown to 32nd, and hopefully when they get the uh, extension going, we can go further into Woodlawn. So there's a lot of synergy, there's a lot of energy about how the city is going to move forward in the next, you know, 20 to 30 years with the transportation plan, and it's already started. So, open question to the panelists. Based on, you know, what do you see now that we need in our toolbox to help keep that momentum going that we've currently started building on? We've got some trails developed, we've got some projects going, we've got some user groups that are utilizing the system, but what do we need for next steps? Where, where are we gonna go next in terms of in the toolbox that we need to have? I've been thinking about this question. Um, I, uh, I think one of the things that's actually a low-hanging fruit that uh, we could start on immediately is to plant some trees in some of our empty tree wells and landscape offers. We have a lot of available space around the city to do that. And we're entering into the fall, which is a great time to plant new trees. And so uh, I would love it if uh, this fall, and I don't know that there's one organization in Birmingham 
like I've seen in other cities that is dedicated to planting and maintaining street trees. And so I would love it if this fall, uh, somebody started this initiative to even just plant a couple of trees in some of our empty tree wells and landscape buffers. That is an easy thing that we can do, uh, but it is certainly impactful and it's hot in Birmingham. And so I think that's a big thing that we can do. Yes, Karen? Uh, what I would love to see is more corporate engagement. Uh, I think one of our, the will is there. I think the conversation's there. I think we uh, are moving in the right path, but it'd be really wonderful if we had more of the hard hitters, the um, people who are really shaping our, our workforce uh, involved. And I know that UAB has taken a big step into that. Um, I wonder now what that UAB, but UAB has taken a big step into that. Um, Alabama Power, some of our other big corporate sponsors. And I would love to see that continued um, and be used as a way that we can increase um, workforce coming in to Birmingham. I think that could be a great next step. Yeah, I think the employment question is critical. We, we, know, we know trails and sidewalks all give us a quality of life element um, for us to individually access that. But what does it do for economic development specifically? What are we seeing from employment or economic development of these trails and these places that are starting to develop for the city of Birmingham? I agree with that um, in the corporate cooperation. Um, and I think as we forward um, the whole branding of the Red Rock, more people understand what the Red Rock is and what that represents, um, then you'll get more cooperation on that. And people just need to recognize it. Uh, James, I love it. You bring up the tree. Um, you know, I'm a tree hugger. And uh, <laughs> Mayor Cost from the Valley too, she said it. Um, but trees are so important in walkability and making the walking environment pleasant. You know, it's pretty hot here in the summertime and uh, reflection on the pavement and everything. The trees go a long way to help make a more pleasant environment, help manage stormwater, um, and uh, you know, sequester um, carbon, um, CO2, produce oxygen. It just, you know, there's so many benefits from it. And you'll be glad to know that the Rotary Club of Birmingham is planting 120 trees along the first avenue south this mm. November. So there's your few trees. All right, that's great. We'll start working on for the next week. For me, I think that uh, something that we can do without a lot of cost is begin to uh, uh, remove the one-way streets, make them two-way streets, mm. calm the speeds. Uh, just looking at some of the times of trying to uh, uh, cross the street and someone's making their left or right turn uh, and almost getting hit when I've got to walk. These are some of the things we can put a little paint out on the road just to make sure people see that you need to watch for pedestrians crossing the street before we even move into the complete streets implementation phase. We can begin looking at how we can calm the speeds get rid of some of the one-way traffic, make it two ways so people can slow down. So what are some of those other additional design elements that we can introduce into a street cross section or a place that go beyond just the 10 or 12 feet of asphalt or concrete we're putting down for the connectivity piece? You mentioned paint. What are some other things that we need to be mindful of from design elements in this uh, physical environment? From a design? From a design element, I think that uh, I'll just harken back to tactical uh, urban pop-up. I think if we could get down and show uh, some of our most traveled thoroughfares where you can actually throw some cones on the ground, a little bit of a spray chalk to slow things down, I think that will allow the design phase to move a lot smoother. working with Better Blocks program um, this fall, I believe, is it October 27th? Mm -hmm. That's what's happening? Yeah, there's going to be a um, capital pop-up uh, streetscape design at um, 2nd Avenue South there in the Dock Pepper area. And um, we're, we're actually working together on um, the streetscape design from on 2nd South from um, 24th to 32nd. And so this pop-up demonstration is going to test what we're discussing as an overall design. So it's very exciting. Look for that. Uh, in that design, you're going to see a uh, road put on a road diet, you know, because it's very wide, bike, wide road. So we can decrease the amount of lanes, um, put in bike lanes, 
and bump outs at the intersections. Um, bump outs are, um, you know, where you expand into the corner um, at beyond uh, the parking, the parking on each side of the road, and um, that makes it safer for uh, pedestrians to cross. It narrows the um, road width, so it's, it's much safer, and it's traffic calm uh, as well. Oh, oh and we're going to plant trees too. <laughs> I think you guys handled the engineering part of it, so uh, that's a good job. Um, I think that the uh, one of the things that we could do, um, or one of the benefits or opportunities that we have in Birmingham that's really nice, is that we, uh, in addition to this great street grid that we have downtown that gives us a lot of flexibility, we have wide streets and we're not covered up in congestion the way that other streets are, and so that gives us an opportunity to reallocate that space in a way that, in a way that other cities don't necessarily have that opportunity. So it gives us a lot of flexibility. And additionally, I think the thing that we can do is not just be advocates to our peers and, and neighbors, but also be advocates uh, to the elected officials. It's hard, it's politically difficult to invest in infrastructure. You know, even though there are a lot of benefits to it, it's, it's just very challenging to do that. Um, and I know in our department, um, in a city where we used to have a population of 350,000 and we now have a population of 200,000, and so those resources have been so desperately constrained, but our infrastructure is the same size. Um, those investments are, it's challenging, and so prioritizing is key, but also making sure that we're just continuously advocating for investing in that infrastructure that's important. So being advocates is important. Uh, from the freshman of interest, uh, we, we don't design them, but uh, we do advocate to make sure that as we start looking at these next uh, trail segments, these complete streets, that we really look at the environmental impact that we're making. I think we have a big opportunity, uh, especially in the future, to really look at environmental health as part of um, our city's overall health and in infrastructure. Uh, we, and I, I would just love for, for the conversation to kind of change in that way um, and make sure that we are planting the trees, that we are making ourselves a hospital place for the wildlife that calls us home as well. And, and then that also impacts our health and our general well-being and happiness and um, heat, heat issues in the summer. So um, I think that's a big opportunity that we haven't quite gotten to yet, but I hope in this next phase we can really, really dig in. Well, I would say right now Birmingham is leading overall the state in terms of construction of trails. I think the, throughout the state of Alabama, there's a lot of great trail projects that are going on. We've heard a few earlier. You know, Chief Ladaga, there's um, the bikeway trail, the underground bikeway trail, if you all don't know about this, going from Mobile to Toronto, that kind of intersects across the uh, little bit of Mississippi and Alabama right there up and down the borders, it crosses our state, that gets utilized. So there's a lot of great biking and trail opportunities throughout the state now. Um, so as we're going forward, our, what are some of the top priorities that you may have, specifically the projects you're working on, that you're either going to be building on from knowledge you know of in our region, or are you taking examples from other states, other places you've been that, oh, we need to do that, we can replicate that, this is something we'll do next? So I think we have, because we are further behind than some cities, I think that that is actually a valuable place to be because hindsight is 2020. So we're able to look at what other cities have done, the challenges that have come up that were unexpected, the successes that maybe were planned or unplanned, and we're able to use that uh, to influence what we're doing. Um, so we do look heavily on, on other, other cities. Um, I think one of the things that's important to, to our department is that we um, look at our peer cities, and so that's one of the things that we've got even identified on our org chart as some of our partners are our peer cities. And so we've started doing that with a number of things like uh, crash safety, and specifically we're gonna be dig digging into uh, pedestrian crash safety to understand where some of those pedestrian um, incidents are occurring. And so uh, we're hoping to maybe visit some peer cities. I think that's something that we can do over time, but I think those partnerships with other people so that we're not reinventing the wheel, I think that's critical for our department. You know, traveling to other places and seeing what they've done is crucial, and, and we've learned so much, and, um, and, and they're great examples of what can be done. Um, my family and I travel um, once a year to the Chief Ladaga. Uh, we stay in Aniston overnight, we eat at this great restaurant, Garfinkel's, and um, we ride the trail um, to the state line and back, 
and it's a blast. Um, this past um, Labor Day, we went to Greenville, South Carolina with two other couples and uh, had a long destination weekend where we stayed downtown, we rode all the trails, um, we walked to restaurants. Who's been to Greenville, South Carolina? Raise your hand. It, does, is that not just trails on steroids or what? I mean, they have a Chihuly glass sculpture on their trail, uh, which if you're familiar with the artist Chihuly glass sculpture, and it's pretty amazing. Um, they, they have made a commitment to um, maintaining their trails, <laughs> no doubt. Um, and, that, and that's what, it, what it's all about, is um, areas making a commitment and, and changing your space so, to achieve those things. For my day-to-day -day advice, Sharon, uh, I look at the disruptive force, the, the, the disruptive forces that are arising for my market, and that is dockless, uh, bicycles and scooters. How many of you all saw the uh, bird launch a few weeks ago? Great. How many of you all think that will impact the walkability of our city? Okay. So what I like to do in the coming days is begin to discuss with our leadership how do we uh, not uh, uh, not allow this to happen, but for lack of a better phrase right now, how do we um, relegate and dictate how these deployments happen in, in the future. How do we make sure that when you do launch, that uh, to a councilman of Quinn's point, that this new modality is in the right spot. So it doesn't impact the uh, public right of way of any citizen. So that's what we're working on in the immediate future because it's obviously, they have arrived, they launched them without asking, and they were a part of our city for a minute. So that's what we need, that's what we're working on, and that's how we're looking at our future from my day to day. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'll make the plug too. I think one of the design elements that we, we talked about a little bit, um, and I think Jenny's touched on it in other ways, is uh, wayfinding. You need to be very simple as to how to get around, how to utilize the system, how to link into the system that you can quickly and easily find your way that it's not impossible to just discover the trail but the trail is easily marked and it's a first choice an easy choice for you to make from the very beginning and I think that's something we're, we're still working through in the city of Birmingham is that overall wayfinding and how do you find these places um, so you can go and enjoy First Avenue South um, Keith can speak to it from a zip user our number one stations on the weekends are Railroad Park and Pepper Place. And it's that movement, that corridor that's showing that's the experience people are wanting to have right now when they get out as a recreational user just to try out the system in the urban environment. And how can that easily extend to, because from Railroad Park, in the Red Rock system, you're, easy, you're able to go down to the Valley Creek, and Valley Creek takes you to High Ore Line, High Ore Line takes you to the Red Mountain, Red Mountain then at some point will connect to Homewood, Homewood connects in the Mountain Brook system, Mountain Brook swings back up and connects back into the, the Birmingham system. So already there's this internal loop of a couple hundred miles that connect four and five municipalities that you could be utilizing on the weekend if you know where to go. And sometimes it's just getting into that system and understanding where to start and where those rides end. So as we've got a few more minutes to wrap up, um, is there something that you would like to say that we didn't discuss yet in terms of the questions before we open it up to Q&A with the public? Would you like to end on where's next for what you're doing now or an exciting project that you might be working on at the moment that touches into this kind of conversation? Well, we're working on, um, as I mentioned, 2nd Avenue South, and what's following with that project is 7th Avenue South uh, from 24th to 32nd, and then 29th Street South. Um, so all of those streets will be placed on road diets and see streetscape improvements. Mm -hmm. We're also working on 18th Street in Homewood, which, you know, that's almost the same as 20th. You know, you go over the mountain and, and Vulcan's gone through some changes, and there's the Vulcan Trail that's going to connect from five, maybe five from five points to um, Vulcan, and then maybe down into Homewood as well. Um, but we keep mentioning the Chief Ladaga Trail. 
you know, what a great trail that is. And, you know, when the Red Rock is built out, the Five Mile Creek Trail I see is our chief medallion locally. Um, I think people come from afar to ride that trail when that's fully built. Um, and so I think that's one of the next exciting um, pieces of the master plan. I think I would just emphasize one more time um, that it's important for us to be ambassadors for the trade-offs uh, because we don't do a road diet without uh, an impact to traffic. So just out here on 10th Avenue, for example, we went from a four-lane roadway to a three-lane roadway. And while I think it's still very efficient, it, we did lose a little bit of vehicular capacity. And so I think it's important to be honest about that and to acknowledge that, but then also to be an ambassador to talk about the benefits that come with that because now we have these great bike lanes and that makes our streets more walkable as well. And so as we do that across the city, I think that we'll see some restrictions to our vehicular access, um, or at least some impacts to it, and that's okay. And I think we need to be ambassadors as to why that's okay because of the benefits. Uh, we've got a lot of exciting things coming along. Um, I'm very excited about the Five Mile Creek. Uh, we, that is going to be eventually a 35 mile trail, but right now we're working we just acquired the land for 17 miles, which will be our longest trail in Jefferson County. Uh, so we've got a lot of work to do, but I, I would just encourage people, if this is something you're interested in, uh, get involved, um, follow us, come to come to the community meetings that the city and ZIP and Freshwater Land Trust hold. Um, act, be an active participant um, so that we can best shape our community uh, to the community needs. Um, and, and be a user and tell your friends. Tell your friends that this is happening. Um, I have my own friends sometimes tell me that, did I know that there was a trail that I just um, helped open? And I just, <laughs> so, so tell your friends and tell them often because it takes many, many times for it to sink. Yeah. How many times does it take to tell a friend? You know, how many times before it sinks in? It's, I mean, I've not reached the limit yet, I don't know. For Zip Bike Share, uh, my colleague Brandon Stuckey worked hard to, uh, over the last year and a half or so, to bridge a partnership with the Housing Authority of Birmingham to conduct a pilot program for 35 residents for our Access for All uh, membership. It's a subsidized membership, $15 per membership. It's an uh, annual membership that allows access for 365 days. And uh, the cool thing about this, this is all part of our Safe Routes to Park plan. It's at least one of the sites, the other uh, housing area in Southtown. So we're going to expand our, um, our ridership because, uh, as you know, urban planning uh, will help public health, as some of our previous presenters said. So we're actually impacting the community where these ladies with chronic disease really rest. So hopefully we can get great uh, data, good ridership, and give people want a healthier, uh, a fast track to a healthier lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Well, we've got a few minutes left. Um, are there any questions from the audience? Yes, sir. Hi, I'm Joe Babin. I have owned a salon in Southside for 15 years, and we started our Five Points Alliance Committee probably about six years ago, five years ago, really. It kind of got going about four years ago. Um, I'm wondering, I've gone to these meetings, I've gone to these things like this for five years now. We've gone to all these different things. How do we get people like you excited about five points? Because I hear you talking about Second Avenue, and I hear you talking about the railroad park, and I hear you talking about all these things. And we have a very beautiful park, Brother Road Park, that nobody gets excited about. We have all these awesome spots in Southside that have supported all of those businesses to make the railroad park happen. Like, how do we get people excited? How do we keep the businesses that have been there forever still going when we can't ever get anything? We even have KPS drawn up a whole new Southside design that we can't use. We have these parks at UAB. Uh, designed out on 16th and 18th that nobody wants to get behind to support. <laughs> and it's like we're in this little neighborhood that's got so much personality and so much design to it. Like how do we get people excited about that without having the names that are behind 2nd Avenue and uh, Dr. Pepper Place and all this other stuff? How do we get that down the south side? 
Like, how do you get that involved in that day? Right. Well, did you um, hear me briefly mention that uh, about the trail from Five Points to Vulcan that connect, connection? Yeah. So that's that's inserting the Five Points in, into that conversation. And I, I think everybody up here would be excited uh, about Five Points. Um, you have our attention. Um, and, and, and all the other neighborhoods, too. I mean, we want to connect the dots everywhere. But I'll tell you this, trail build, building and walkability is some of the hardest work around. And it's the long game. It, you know, this does not get done in a year or two years. That second avenue project, I've been working on that for five years. Um, we applied for funding first and then got some momentum and stuff. Uh, so really, it, that's, that's the tough part of it. And, and I think it's different in other states where they have some tax um, taxes that go toward this work. Um, and Georgia and Tennessee are very good at that. Um, in this state, we just have more, more challenge. We have more challenges that way. But um, and, and when I when people ask me, um, when are they going to do this? And I always say, who are they? Um, we are the they. And if you want a sidewalk, if you want a trail. You're the day you've got to go and engage with your leadership and, with, and join groups or, or form a group or whatever. And, um, and, and you've got to be prepared for the long game. Um, because we started on Homewood Shades Creek Greenway in the early 90s. And we're just now looking at phase two going to bid this fall. And then hopefully in the next couple of years, phase three. Um, and then in the next few years, phase four. Four, which maybe will connect up with Red Mountain Park. Mm -hmm. So it, it's a long game. Yeah, I'd like to add to the uh, importance of the local stakeholders. And uh, so, Joe, I'd like to give a shout out to your salon. That's where I get my hair cut. <laughs> you guys do a great job. And your investment uh, locally there has been important, but uh, just as important, your involvement in that business alliance, I think, has been critical because with respect to who is the they, it's those like local stakeholders that make things happen. And uh, to that point, uh, you guys have had some success recently with uh, when the Better Block Foundation came to Birmingham and they looked at different sites, uh, you guys were persuasive uh, and secured one of the two spots where we're gonna do a pop-up this fall, so that's really exciting. Um, and, but I also would say that uh, some of those other projects, like Jane said, uh, like trails and like the parks, they're big projects. And so there's a lot of opportunities to do smaller things um, which are more immediate, such as you know choosing an empty or struggling tree well and fixing that up. There's a lot of things that are hands-on that people can do. And I know that the Five Points Neighborhood Association does a great job of doing street cleanup days. But um, I think that local stakeholder advocacy is what's really the, the key. Other question? I went to the uh, Dreamland uh, invitation for um, the discussion of Brother Brian Park. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, after that meeting, I went back and uh, discussed with our uh, Safe Routes and Park partner about your plan. And I got James on a telephone call to discuss your initiatives. So you are on the national radar right now about how can you all partner to find funding to get that done. So um, uh, I'll continue working with James and see what type of uh, traction we can get on the national level for any type of grant funds that we can hopefully get some movement on your request. Uh, I have a question about the
for certain residents to understand the tie in between walkability and public health and economic development. You know what I mean? Like, we get it, but that's why we're here. And of course, we're going to expand our knowledge on that. But as somebody who, you know, hears many different things, what's, what things are being done, you know, to kind of aid that on the uh, Can I answer this one? So I will say that um, we, UAB and Birmingham received a REACH grant from CDC several years ago, and through that we were able to fund what a program that is now called Parks RX that the Jefferson County Department of Health and Freshwater Land Trust um, kind of helped to create. And so that is at a local level, at a physician level. Uh, we have some pharmacies that are included in that. We have doctors, and we would love to see this continue to be expanded um, to different groups, but it is that educational component that being outside is not only good for your physical well-being, but your mental well-being and your overall well-being. Um, it's good for community uh, engagement, which can um, you know lead to healthier lives in general. And so that is something that we have been plugging and pushing to not only create the infrastructure online where you can go and find those resources of what is my closest trail or park, but you also have a physician or your pharmacist who is talking through the importance of using those spaces and why they should be a priority uh, within your community. Right. I think we've got time for one more question before we've got to wrap up. Uh, Sarah, do you want to I take can run. run and get some steps. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about being active. Who wants it? There's a generation of, of young people coming up. Remember what Mayor Cox said? She, she's reaching out to youth and engaging them in, in their council. So I think there is at least a partial answer to this question, which is, I don't know that I have to know that answer, 
I have to know to ask so that people can help get an answer. Um, there was a, a reading in Colorado. Um, they were doing a, a transit system and they were doing free transit passes. If you, your school ID acts as a transit pass. They did not have any adults involved in the creation of the media campaign for that. The high school kids using high school mascots, they did this rap song, it was hysterically funny. I, had to, I watched the YouTube video six times. It was about the right length, they know that about two and a half minutes attention span. It was funny, it was engaging, it also made very clear that my school ID acts as a transit pass, which was the takeaway message. It's a tiny glimpse into, I think, a partial answer knowledge question, which is, let's not us try to invent that wheel if there are people out there that are better equipped. Is that fair? Yeah, very fair. Can you build on it? Thanks. Mm. So I, just, I didn't mean to interrupt, but I think it's a really important question. I've been thinking about it since you asked me last time. I think uh, there are two natural disincentives that will come along with uh, walkability just by the very nature of them. Um, and I think in general, it's, it's more important to promote the positive alternatives. However, um, as we reallocate some space, so we reallocate some of the car lanes, that's going to start to become a little bit of a disincentive. And then the second, and maybe it's even more powerful, is as we build walkable development, it becomes harder and harder to park our cars, and it becomes more expensive to park our cars. But the, and so that is a, a powerful disincentive. Um, but I, I don't know that I would necessarily pursue it from that direction as an, an aggressive war on cars. It's just that's a natural thing that occurs with creating the positive things, the walkability and, and those things that come with it. So I think naturally there will be some disincentives. Uh, but I'm more excited about the positives. I think we got it. <laughs> well, thank you all so much for uh, this panel discussion and your time. And uh, a round of our panelists.